And before this video begins, I'd like to give a special shout out to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez. For an ongoing series to reach its 10th anniversary is a huge deal. That's an entire decade. Even Game of Thrones, one of the most popular shows of all time, only aired for 8 years. So imagine the significance of a show reaching its 50th anniversary. This is the exact milestone Doctor Who managed to reach in 2013. Now obviously it hadn't been airing for that entire half century. But the franchise had always made sure to celebrate every single decade in a significant way. After 10 years, three incarnations of the Doctor teamed up to fight an evil Time Lord. 10 years after that, four out of five of the existing Doctors joined forces in the ambitious story The Five Doctors. Even after the show went off air, there was Dimensions in Time, but we don't talk about that one. Therefore, when Doctor Who approached its golden anniversary, showrunner Stephen Moffat was under pressure to deliver the most impressive and epic anniversary of them all, since the show was bigger and more popular than ever before. In order to celebrate both the show's past and help solidify its future success, he created The Day of the Doctor. Seeing the 11th Doctor meet his predecessor and the newly revealed War Doctor in a climactic adventure spanning all of time and space. It's safe to say this episode was a rousing success, with cinema screenings and critical acclaim. But as we near the show's 60th anniversary, does this episode actually still stand the test of time? Or was everyone too caught up in the excitement of the moment? Well, dust off your sun shoes and Mario jump into some paintings, because it's time to review The Day of the Doctor. Ding. What's that? It's a machine that goes ding. The Day of the Doctor is one of those few Doctor Who stories that can be described as event television. There was so much hype around it that you could genuinely compare it to marquee dramas like Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. It was a really big deal with so much advertising behind it. You pretty much couldn't escape the promotion of the special because that's how significant it was. Everyone was paying attention. Just look at the Radio Times having 12 different covers, one for each Doctor. Now that's dedication. But while we're on the topic of magazines, I've recently been diving headfirst into all sorts of magazines to try and up my reviewing game, and Readly has been a huge help, since it gives me instant access to so many film and TV magazines, allowing me to see what's going on in the media landscape. It's not even just the brand new releases either, you can go back in time with loads of old editions too. It's such an easy to navigate app, and I love how much time and space it saves, since you don't have to deal with well, all of this. Instead, you can keep it all neatly arranged on your phone and take your magazines on the go with offline reading too, which was a big help when I recently had to take a four hour journey to Cardiff. Even with all that time, I barely scratched the surface of Readly, because it has over 6,000 high quality magazines for every kind of hobby or interest. You can even read your local newspaper or entire international papers too, which I found fascinating. And hey, just between you and me, if you like the sound of Readly, you can actually get two months free access by clicking the link in my description. And even better, you can cancel any time. So why not give it a spin and see if it'll inspire you like it did for me when I was making this video. It helped remind me of the sheer scale and ambition of Day of the Doctor, because the episode tries to compete with all those tentpole TV shows you constantly see on the covers of magazines. Day of the Doctor is an epic story, and that's instantly obvious from the beginning, with this huge cinematic intro of the Doctor being taken to the National Gallery. The music is this big, like, anthem arrangement of I Am The Doctor, and the opening credits being shown alongside the visuals give it a very movie-like feel. It's great stuff, immediately establishing this big screen vibe and setting it apart from the traditional openings the show had been used to for the modern era, especially because this episode used the original intro from the 1960s. The sequence also establishes Clara Oswald's new job as a school teacher working at Coal Hill School, which the Doctor's granddaughter Susan attended at the start of the show. A lot of people tend to criticise just how sudden her career change is, but I think it's perfectly justified and in line with Clara's characterisation in Series 7B. I mean, she was literally a nanny, meaning she has a lot of experience with looking after children and educating them. 
Also, at the beginning of the Rings of Akaton, we can briefly see a photo of Clara Graduation University. It's never outright stated what she actually studied, so you can easily just assume she has a teaching degree or something. Hell, maybe her planned trip around the world was also a holiday before coming back to work as a teacher. So when Day of the Doctor starts and Clara is suddenly a teacher, it's quite easy to accept and get behind. After all, she also has the Doctor to vouch for her, since the chairman is his old companion, Ian Cheddar Cheesington. And that's Miss Wright and that's Charlton. <laughs> what you might call tempting providence, Jessamine. But you're wrong about one thing, Chesterfield. This isn't like everything else. It's Chesterton. Yes. Eh? But I know that. Yes, Day of the Doctor is packed full of references and cheeky nods to the storied history of the show. There was even a planned scene with Kate revealing to Clara that the Peter Cushion movies were actually real films in the universe and were based on the memoirs of Ian and Barbara's adventures with the Doctor. I really wish that scene hadn't been scrapped because of riots. I like how many Doctor Who references there are throughout this episode. So many easter eggs for fans to notice and enjoy. But my biggest problem with Day of the Doctor is how it's not really a 50th anniversary. It's more like an 8th anniversary of New Who. Almost the whole episode is purely about characters and concepts from the modern era. The selection of Doctors, the Time War, hell even the modernised version of UNEP. It's all New Who, not Classic Who. Instead all the homages to the original run of the show are relegated to these basic references and throwaway lines of dialogue. You can only glimpse the celebrations of Classic Who. Day of the Doctor pushes all of the modern stuff to the forefront, but kind of shoves Classic Who into a cupboard in the background. The celebration of the other 42 years instead ends up in documentaries and the incredible Five-ish Doctors reboot, which is a much better 50th anniversary, giving fair treatment to old and new alike. It's disappointing how little Day of the Doctor acknowledges the show's more long-term history, and that is a significant mark against it. However, the special does involve UNIT, which is an aspect straddling both new and old. Doctor Who wouldn't be what it is without this Earthbound organisation responsible for dealing with the threats the Doctor isn't around for, and covering up the adventures they do have. It could honestly be argued that UNIT saved the show entirely, since it had almost been cancelled before the ambitious change in direction with Season 7, which grounded the Doctor on Earth to face threats. This decision helped to reinvigorate the show and bring interest back to Doctor Who, since it was more in line with the TV and film of the time. Therefore it goes without saying that UNIT deserves a part in the 50th anniversary, especially because it had become a core element of the revival after its reintroduction in the Russell T Davis era. I think it has a nice presence in the special, seeing the return of recently reintroduced Kate Stewart and serving as the centrepiece of the Earth-based Zygon invasion as they get up to their usual unit tricks. They're not there to hog the spotlight, they just act as convenient narrative tools every now and then, keeping the plot ticking along by bringing characters to locations and giving important exposition when needed. However, I personally can't stand the new character Osgood. She's so annoying and badly characterised, almost like a mocking caricature of Doctor Who fans since she's obsessed with the Doctor, and even cosplays him like some sort of clingy fangirl. It's not really cute or endearing, it's just cringe. Be like Malcolm instead. I'm Team Malcolm all the way. I've never understood Osgood's popularity. Oi, you! Are you science, eh? Similarly to UNIT, one of the few ways this special does honour the past is by reintroducing the Zygons, shapeshifting monsters who hadn't appeared since one story in 1975. Huh, sounds like the perfect way to represent Classic Who. I'm not sure why they got the call above all other classic monsters, but I guess there were none left to bring back, since the show had already revived most of the iconic ones by this point. It's like scraping the bottom of the barrel, especially because a Time Lord villain would have been beating a horse so dead it's already a pile of ash and dust on the floor. However, Day of the Doctor does a good job reintroducing the Zygons and making them an interesting threat right from the beginning, along with updating their design to make them much more realistic and less like men in awkward rubber suits. This time, they actually look like aliens. The Zygons are established in the form of the 10th Doctor hunting one during his escapades with Queen Elizabeth I during his farewell tour thing, 
and it's a really fun sequence, immediately telling you all you need to know about the Zygons and their ability to perfectly blend in to manipulate them, how they're basically the Slatheen on a modium. The scene even finds time for a nice joke about their abilities, with Ten wrongly assuming that Elizabeth is a Zygon and going on this big speech about how obvious their deception is, only to realise it's actually the horse. I have no idea how she's still married to him after all of that. Talk about loyalty. I guess it finally answers the long-standing question nobody was asking about why Queen Elizabeth I hated the Doctor so very much in the Shakespeare Code. However, just as he's chasing after rabbits and English queens, the 10th Doctor actually runs into the 11th Doctor, who has jumped through a portal from the present day. One of the staples of anniversary specials was the idea of multi-Doctor team-ups, seeing different incarnations of the character come together in the same place at the same time and getting up to wacky hijinks. Stephen Moffat had already dabbled with this concept back in the 2007 mini-show Time Crash, which was basically David Tennant's make-a-wish since he got to act alongside his favourite child in incarnation and future father-in-law Peter Davison. Multi-Doctor stories have been and always will be incredibly popular among fans, so in order to satisfy the audience and lend credence to the momental nature of this special, Moffat decided to pair up the 11th and 10th Doctors. I love their relationship and their banter together. It's inspired by that of the 2nd and 3rd Doctors in the show's original anniversary team-up and they have so many fun moments. It's almost like a mini rivalry, they're always making comparisons and trying to outdo each other. It's a joy to watch, with some great comedy taking advantage of the ability to have them share in the screen. Although I do find it a bit of a shame that Ten is the Doctor to return. I know it's because he will always be the definitive modern Doctor, but he had only left the show about three years before, which feels a bit too recent to return. Even so, David Tennant is on top form as always, picking the character back up with ease, swaggering around and hitting the same comedic beats just like we've gotten used to. Ten's link to the Time War and his natural chemistry with, well, anyone, means it's undeniable that his presence generated a lot of interest in the special and helped it succeed. But let's get into the meat of this story, the Time War. One of the biggest and most intriguing aspects introduced alongside Doctor Who's 2005 relaunch was the incredible backdrop of the Time War. This was a massive, unfathomable conflict between the Time Lords and the Daleks, taking place between the show's cancellation and return. It essentially served as a handy reset button for the show, taking away a lot of continuity and lore baggage by outright destroying both sides at the hands of the Doctor himself. It was a really good narrative tool, especially because the emotional effects on the lead character added a lot of contemporary edginess and drama to the show compared to the campy vibes of Classic Who. The Time War kept things relevant in the TV landscape as the Ninth Doctor slowly learned to deal with his guilt and PTSD, new companion Rose Tyler helping him to overcome all these issues. And naturally, since it was such a significant universe-altering event, it would obviously continue to come up during the Tenth Doctor's era, culminating in the climactic end of time, which saw the Time Lords attempting to return to the universe. However, this was basically the end point of the Time War. It was basically over now and had no more purpose, especially since Moffat became showrunner and only briefly included mentions of the war. He still felt like there were lasting implications for the Doctor's character though, so he decided that the climax of the Time more would be the perfect hook for his epic anniversary special. I've always strongly believed that the Time War should never be seen or even described in detail because it's clear that Russell T Davis intended it as this almost unimaginable, surreal conflict taking place in multiple dimensions and levels of consciousness, with all sorts of crazy things happening. The biggest fascination of the Time War was the fact we never got to see it. We only ever heard these horrific tales and had to try imagining it, which in turn only ever made it more mysterious. Moffat took a big risk deciding to physically show the conflict on screen, but I think he handles it well. This is just the final day of the Time War. All the crazy stuff has already happened, all the incredible weaponry has already been used up, and now all that's left is just traditional warfare as the Daleks assault Gallifrey. This is the final battle, when both sides have just had to resort to the basics because that's all they've got left. These scenes look amazing, doing a wonderful job communicating the bloodshed and brutality of the war in a way we've never even thought of before. It drives everything home for us as a viewer because it's something we can understand and relate to, so it's excellent stuff. It allows us to properly appreciate the position the Doctor is in, because this is something we can actually put our own lives to. 
In the dying days of the last great time war, only one man has the conviction and compassion to end the entire conflict for good and declare no more, even if it does make him a monster. This man is the War Doctor, who actually should have never even existed. Originally this would have been the Ninth Doctor, but it soon became clear Christopher Eccleston still wouldn't return to the show after his very poor treatment during production of Series 1. It's a shame the Ninth Doctor couldn't be involved, because his character arc had implied he had been the specific one to end the Time War. However, thanks to the opening of Series Series 1, an opportunity presented itself, because the Ninth Doctor had seemingly recently regenerated. So instead, maybe it was the Eighth Doctor who ended the war. Well, apparently not, because Moffat didn't think it was appropriate for the Incarnation, but I've never believed this excuse. If anything, the Eighth Doctor was the most malleable incarnation of the Doctor, thanks to his single live-action appearance in 1996. So his characterization could have easily been altered. After all, just look at how much trauma and loss the character goes through in his Big Finish audios. He even had his own mini Time Lord Victorious moment at the end of the 2011 audio to the death. You better come with me. Why? To stop me. Don't you want to make sure your bad old grandfather doesn't take the laws of time into his own hands? I'm not sure I like what's happening to you, grandfather. Yeah, it's probably best you leave me alone. The character had been developed extensively by Big Finish, so the Incarnation's involvement in the Time War would have been perfectly believable, especially with the 2012 box set Dark Eyes actually serving as a prelude for the conflict, coincidentally being released a year before this special. The groundwork had all been there, but for some reason Moffat suddenly made excuses. Call me a conspiracy theorist, but I think the BBC stepped in and vetoed the inclusion of the Eighth Doctor because of the largely negative perception of the TV movie he starred in. They probably didn't want to associate with it, so instead our Lord and Saviour Paul McGann was relegated to a short mini-sode on YouTube. It's a tragedy. Hashtag McGann Gang. So instead of the Eighth Doctor finally getting the TV time he deserved, Moffat created a surprise in-between incarnation called The War Doctor, who he introduced in the shocking cliffhanger of Name of the Doctor. I like the surprise because of how well they hid it, literally nobody knew. Except a few Americans who accidentally got the copy early. The War Doctor is a truly fascinating character. Casting John Hurt as this renegade Doctor was an inspired choice, because he perfectly lends this feeling of weariness to this incarnation who has seen such horrors and been left permanently emotionally scarred by the war. Who are you? No. They are the Doctor. The scene of him in the barn is fantastic, grappling with the decision to end the entire conflict right then and there. He's so dramatically different from the happy-go-lucky Doctors we've become used to, so he genuinely feels like a completely separate person. Throughout the episode, he never really allows himself to get caught up in the enthusiasm and jokes of his two future incarnations. Also, just as a side note, I love when the trio go into the TARDIS and it freaks out switching desktop themes, because it's confused by the different incarnations. That's a fun touch and it's nice to see the coral again, whilst also catching a glimpse of the really nice War Doctor TARDIS. But in general, there is such an authenticity to the character of the War Doctor. He is so tired and bitter, hating himself for what he has decided he has to do to end the war. I love this idea of a renegade incarnation of the character, one who has committed so many atrocities and acted so undoctor-like that the other incarnations flat out refuse to acknowledge him. There's so much potential in a character like the War Doctor, and I think this episode achieves it well. It's not like he's a psychopath, he's just a weary soldier, since the Doctor realised the Time War was unavoidable. He is out of options now and knows the moment is the only chance at ending it. He doesn't do it because he's evil and wants to kill everyone, he just knows it's the only way out now because the Daleks won't stop, and the Time Lords have become so obsessed with the war that they won't stop either, and all the innocents are being caught in the crossfire, so to take such an extreme way to end the war is all he can do. It kind of sows the seeds for the Twelfth Doctor's Am I a Good Man plot, and this line at the beginning of the episode kind of sums up the general themes. Waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. One. The moment is such a powerful weapon because it has developed its own conscience and ability to communicate, essentially the sentient weapon of mass destruction. It's really cool how the actual physical weapon becomes this voice of reason, like a ghost showing the Doctor his future, since only the War Doctor can see her. I really like the choice to have the moment portrayed by Billy Piper. 
Originally, Moffat wanted her to return as Rose, being paired with the Tenth Doctor during their time together, because after all, Rose was such a pillar of Doctor Who's early success. However, her journey had ended pretty conclusively in Series 4, a fitting end for the character's time on the show, so a return would have muddied that. So having Billy Piper playing a different character in this episode is the ideal middle ground maintaining that link to Series 1 without being excessive with nostalgia and cameos, since the moment is simply assuming a form from the Doctor's timeline. She constantly crops up and guides the War Doctor, just like Clara who doesn't really have a whole lot to do in the episode, but she has a good relationship with the War Doctor, really coming to understand him and serve as a positive light and sense of optimism for his future. They're a good pairing and play off each other well. She almost serves as this kind of angel on his shoulder, showing that she doesn't hate him like the other Doctors do, and I think that really inspires the Doctor into wanting to do the right thing this time. And if I grow to be half the man that you are, Clara Oswald, a good example of the moment's influence as a ghostly phantom is during the Tower of London scene, where she helps the War Doctor understand the different perspectives of 10 and 11, who each have contrasting views on the importance of remembering how many children on Gallifrey died that day, the moment characterising 10 as the man who regrets and 11 as the man who forgets. It almost acknowledges how the Time War had less of a focus, because it was actually the Doctor bottling it up and trying to move on, whilst the 10th Doctor is still plagued by guilt because of how Raw it all is. They're both equally valid and highlight the different stages they're at in processing the decision. It's this powerful window into War's future, showing who he is destined to become. But luckily Moffat didn't keep his initial plan of having the three modern Doctors just a dream, whose existence was erased at the end of the story. So you know what, I'd take a timeless child over that any day of the week. This Tower of London scene is such a fantastic moment on a character level. The rest of the episode is so fast paced that they never have any time to stop. But now that they're locked away, they actually have to stand still and deal with the emotional aspects of the Time War. 10 and 11 are forced to share a prison with the man they despise, and it's kind of symbolic of the mental prison ending the Time War trapped the Doctor in. Ooh, the way you both look at me, what is that? Oh yeah, and just like the episode does, I forgot to say what the Zygons are doing during all this, since they're in the narrative for some reason, despite already having more than enough story to tell. They're basically in Elizabethan times, trying to take over the world by jumping into a painting and then hopping back out in present day, trying to take over UNIT by assuming the forms of Kate, Osgood and some random scientist man. Yeah, I don't know, it's a weird plan, but it's a good use of their powers since it allows them to gain access to the mysterious Black Archive, where all the most dangerous and significant items are hidden away. I think it's terrifying how the guard constantly has his mind wiped, so he always thinks it's his first day. It's played off as a joke? but it's actually a horrifying thing to imagine. You just can't do that to someone. It's so immoral, slowly turning their mind into mush as you erase it over and over again, just for secrecy's sake. I don't think that's something the good guys should be doing. The reason Zygon Kate and her lackeys want access is so that she can hijack Kate's voice print to blow up the world with a nuke or something. I don't know, it's sorely underexplored because the villains are such an afterthought. And then Clara just pieces out with a vortex manipulator. So, yay. I think it's clever how the Doctors resolve this Zygon threat. They use the villain's own plan against them, using the magical Time Lord paintings to enter the Time War in a fantastic scene which has truly sublime direction and cinematography. It's a really epic moment and Moffat even slips in some of his beloved timey wiminess by having the Doctor call into the past to make sure the painting ends up in the Black Archive, which allows the protagonist to stroll in, completely evading the TARDIS-proof security measures. And what's even more more clever is the Time Lords making both sides temporarily forget whether they're human or Zygon. It immediately removes any sense of loyalty to a specific species or creed, and instead ignites the basic need for survival, an instinct any living being has, this desperation to live. Neither Kate knows what they actually are, so now they have to work together to save themselves, and agree to the best terms since they don't know if it will benefit them or not. It's smart writing. And the key to perfect negotiation, not knowing what side you're on. It's just a shame this whole Zygon plotline feels so disconnected, since none of it has any relevance to the Time War. 
The dilemma of blowing up the nuke is clearly intended to mirror that of the War Doctors, but the solution isn't turned into some clever parallel to how the Doctors ultimately save Gallifrey. Instead, it feels so out of place and random, because the actual solution stems from a failed plan in the Tower of London, where the trio decided they could use their sonic screwdrivers to calculate some maths over the course of their hundreds of years of combined life and open a door. Yeah, the answer to saving Gallifrey lay in a joke about three incarnations of the Doctor, not realising a door was locked. Wow, amazing writing. With the Zygon Menace defeated, the trio of Doctors now return to that fateful day in the barn. I really like how this is because 10 and 11 don't want War to have to do it alone anymore. It's a responsibility they all bear together, something they all have to live with, so it's a striking visual of them standing unified over this big button representing the annihilation of their entire race. It's a powerful moment, feeling like a suitable climax on a character level, because 10 and 11 have finally forgiven War, now that they're freshly reminded of his impossible decision and how he was only committing such an atrocity with a best of intentions. He is still, at heart, a good man. They no longer reject him and this time want to help him share the burden to reassure him and embrace their shared past. Because after all, they were him once. But then it all gets thrown out of the window as Clara implores the Doctor to find another way. Yeah, because he clearly lived through the entire Time War and killed his own people without trying to plan B first. I dunno, as much as I love this huge climactic moment of all existing Doctors piloting their TARDISes around Gallifrey to technobabble it into a pocket universe, it feels unnecessary. I adore how it uses archive footage, audio and impressions to create this feeling of the previous Doctors actually being there, but I'm just not really sure how they got the memo to actually go there and do it. Like, did the 11th Doctor just pop back to each individual incarnation and say, hey yeah, go here on this day, you'll be able to save the universe? I dunno, saving Gallifrey feels like the wrong way to end the Time War. Sometimes things do go horribly wrong and catastrophes happen, it's part of life. So it feels very cheap to just undo the whole hard-hitting decision the character had to make. Once again, showing Moffat is too sentimental to let anyone stay dead. The episode tries to justify this and maintain the emotional aftermath by claiming the Doctor won't remember if he saved Gallifrey or not, due to the surprise appearance of the 12th Doctor's attack eyebrows. But I still feel like saving Gallifrey removes that defining moment shaping the Doctor for centuries after pushing the button. Moffat was trapped in his fairy tale vision of the show, refusing to believe any incarnation of the Doctor could actually resort to genocide. But that's the whole point of the Time War. It's meant to be uncharacteristic to show how extreme the war was and the effect it had on the Doctor. Instead of accepting this clear character development, Moffat just has the Doctor misremember what actually happened. It feels like a major cop-out to me, especially with how the Finding Gallifrey aspect never really had a focus in Series 8 or 9. It just springs back up one day out of nowhere with no build-up. Oh, the long way round. After ending the Time War in one form or another, the trio all return to the Undergallery, bringing things full circle. It feels like a nice epilogue, them all reflecting on what they went through together and how they don't know if they succeeded or not. I liked how Moffat remained consistent with David Tennant's final words in the show, making sure he still says, I don't want to go, similar to his regeneration three years earlier. I don't want to go. And speaking of regenerations, the War Doctor returns to his TARDIS, where he begins to regenerate. This is a nice way to end his story, since he simply has no purpose anymore. The Eighth Doctor decided his next incarnation had to be a warrior, so now that the Time War is over, the War Doctor has achieved his purpose. There is no need for him now, so it's almost like the Time Lord letting go of the darkness and returning to his natural path as the Doctor. But for now, for this moment, I am the Doctor again. He's basically freed of the Time War, which is why he regenerates here. It was a late addition, which makes me appreciate it even more, because its inclusion does wonders at keeping things connected. After the other Doctors leave, Eleven meets the cryptic Curator, played by none other than Tom Baker. This is a good way to bring an old Doctor back without actually making them the incarnation they played. It's a beautiful scene and it always makes me emotional to see Baker back in the show he defined all those years ago, still with the same whimsical charm and charisma. Even after all those years, he hasn't lost a step. It's implied that the Curator is a retired Doctor assuming the form of previous faces, and this is consistent with the character especially since in both this episode and Name of the Doctor, Eleven laments that he wants to retire. 
It's also quite fitting that Tom Baker takes the form of this retired incarnation, considering the scrapped Douglas Adams story of the Fourth Doctor retiring and being called back to help save the universe. The nature of the Curator as an implied future incarnation of the Doctor actually allows us to realise that Gallifrey was saved, because he finally answers the mystery about the painting, giving its full title as Gallifrey Falls No More. It's the perfect way to end the episode on a very optimistic yet mysterious note, because it's never outright stated he's actually the Doctor, but somehow he knows what no one else knows. I mean, it's obvious he is the Doctor, especially since Big Finish confirmed it, but the episode keeps it just enigmatic enough that it becomes a delightful scene, tying the episode up in a neat, satisfying bow. Perhaps I was you, of course. <laughs> oh, perhaps. You are me. Day of the Doctor is a very ambitious and cinematic Doctor Who special truly worthy of the big screen. The narrative is this huge, epic Time War story featuring multiple different incarnations of the Doctor in an incredible way, with their interpersonal relationships very fun and well written. They all feel like individuals with drastically different outlooks on their situation. The War Doctor is the perfect personification of these effects of the Time War. He's written superbly, and John Hurt absolutely knocks it out of the park with an amazing in performance. Billy Piper is also incorporated into the episode well, without having to return as Rose, so her performance as the moment is a really strong part of the episode. However, Unit and the Zygons feel out of place. There are two entirely separate episodes awkwardly smushed together, so the Zygons just kind of feel completely pointless and just taking time away from everything else. There's also a really disappointing lack of proper Classic Who representation, along with Murray Gold's exceptional soundtrack not even being used, which is a huge shame because the tracks are absolutely incredible. And along with all these factors, the ending is a frustrating retcon of one of the most important aspects of the modern show. Therefore, Day of the Doctor gets a low A ranking on the Series 7B tier list, and the Specials tier list. There are a lot of flaws and it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny, but it's incredibly fun and the episode flies by. It truly feels monumental, so it achieves its purpose well. It's nowhere near the best episode of all time, but it's definitely an amazing feat for the show and it helps both celebrate the past and lay seeds for the future, which is exactly what Moffat intended. So it's always worth a watch and I guess you could say it has a bit of something for everyone. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fowlon Cortez, my Platinum level patron, Maximilian Foreman, and all my Gold level patrons, Calvin, Daniel Shilito, Franz Horn AK Lime Vortex, Golk Noggler, Herner Versog, and Luke underscore SY. Thank you so much for your support.